Well, let me, actually, I'm not going to use the overhead as much. <coughs> let me talk a little bit about <coughs> fracture and fracture toughness. Um, you know, I, a lot of my stories come from failure analyses just because I happen to do a number of failure analyses. Um, <coughs> and you're going to run into failures. Uh, if you haven't already, how many have been in soup ships? Only one of you, two of you. That's sort of surprising. Usually it's about half the class has already been in a soup ship. I'm sure the rest of you will probably be there someday, right? Uh, you've seen plenty of failure, you mean in the field. Yeah, the problem in the field is you have no one to tell you why it occurred, right? At least in a soup ship, you can go to the shipyard uh, engineers and say, why did this thing fail, right? Uh, in, out, in the, out in the ocean, it failed, you know, just replace it, you know. Uh, pardon me? Why don't you fail again? That's right. Well, at least it's consistent, right? You know it's a design problem at that point. Um, the fundamental equation of fracture mechanics is this, <coughs> where this is the, this could be one of two things. It can be either the material toughness or it can be the stress intensity. It has the same units, and they're two different things. That's the stress, sigma. Pi is the constant, like in pi r squared, and A is the crack length, or in some cases, the half crack length. And we'll talk about that in a second, okay? This equation was developed by Griffith in 1925 when he was studying the fracture of brittle materials like glass. If anyone's ever broken glass or seen how a glass cutter breaks glass, they take a little diamond tool and they scratch the glass and then they hit it with a little, you know, give it a little impact and it breaks right where you scratched it. And the reason is, the same thing as that piece of paper that I did for you last time, a brittle material, the more brittle the material is, the more susceptible it is to fracturing right where a defect is. And it's the same thing as I did for you before. You can pull on a perfect piece of paper with several pounds of force. You put a little defect in there, it takes ounces. Paper is a brittle material. It doesn't deform a lot when it fractures. It doesn't stretch. Rubber is a tough material. And you put a little crack like that in rubber, and it, you know, it pulls just about the same as it did without the little flaw because it's tough, it's fracture resistance. So the tougher something is, the less susceptible it is to mechanical damage or, or catastrophic failure. Uh, and the problem that we had with the Liberty ships was basically one of material toughness. People knew about strength, they learned about stress and designing things for strength requirements in the 1880s and 1890s. That's when the tensile test was developed back in those days, okay, 125 years ago. Um, people learned about testing materials to determine what their stress capability was in pounds per square inch. Well, it wasn't really until the Liberty ships in World War II that people started to develop uh, an appreciation for the toughness of a material for structural materials. Um, Although it was Griffith in 1925 studying the fracture properties of glass that actually came up with the fundamental formula. Now the fundamental formula is also dependent on geometry. And so we have these nifty little books like this. The Stress Analysis of Cracks Handbook, okay? So if you want to know every geometry some mathematician has gone through and figured out for an edge crack, okay, an edge crack, looks something like this, okay, where the crack comes in from the edge. A center crack looks like this. Okay, The center crack is typically modeled by a mathematician as having a length of 2A. And so A is the half crack length for a center crack. A is the crack length for an edge crack. That's just because a mathematician never wants to do the whole problem if he's got symmetry, he'll cut it in two, right? And only solve half the problem. So there's actually a logic to it. Um, the edge crack problem and this problem are really not any different in a sense. 
except turns out for the edge crack there's a factor in here of 12% greater okay for a simple edge crack but then you could have it in a cylinder you can have it in all kinds of different conditions and there are whole books written on the subject so if you want to read something one night and you're having a hard time going to sleep this is the book for you right uh, third edition so you know lots of people read this all the time uh, so it's real exciting in any case this is our if I want to know whether something's going to fail I need to know the stress that it's under I need to know what the flaw size population is what size flaws exist in the structure if I'm talking about something that's very brittle like glass I could have a real problem now it turns out that for a very very tough material let's say a steel like let's say HY80 which is a very tough steel or HY100 the critical flaw size may be six inches well if my steel is only if I'm a surface ship and I'm only three-eighths of an inch thick it's hard to get a six inch crack through the thickness okay so you don't get brittle fractures on surface ship hulls in general uh, even on submarines because we can't talk about what their thickness is but it's less than six inches okay um, and therefore as Professor Palou who studies fracture he, he used to say the Navy designs a submarine so that you slowly get squeezed to death rather than uh, the thing fractures and you drown um, so you want a very very tough steel for a, a, a ship uh, particularly if it's a military ship you, you main reason you need it is not for cruising around the ocean it's for if someone shoots at you okay then you have to take explosions um, then you want something that's high toughness now if the material is titanium which has about one-third to one-half the fracture toughness of steel the critical flaw size is all of a sudden down by a factor uh, at one-third the toughness since this is a square root this is inside the square root the critical flaw size is down by a factor of nine and so now you're talking about critical flaw sizes that are less than an inch uh, if you're talking about aluminum which is a little bit less than titanium you can have critical flaw sizes on the order of an eighth of an inch or less in some high strength aluminum alloys so you do have some problems and if you think of the Aloha Air, Airlines disaster remember the Aloha Air, uh, the, the 737 in Hawaii where a whole section of the fuselage just kind of popped off in flight I always thought the amazing thing about that was the rest of the fuselage held together and they were able to land um, but the uh, basically what happened is um, you get different geometries but they had fatigue cracks grow and they didn't have sufficient toughness and eventually the cracks probably got to, you know a couple of inches in size before they actually tore uh, but some flaws in some things I've been dealing with some aluminum wheels on automobiles recently and I calculated a critical flaw size of two millimeters for those wheels before a fatigue crack will start to grow uh, you may need a half inch or a two inch long crack in some cases before you'll get catastrophic failure but fatigue cracks will start to grow at, 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 uh, with a critical flaw size of um, only a few millimeters um, so we're interested in material toughness uh, we're also interested in the stress intensity what we're doing when we put the notch in a material is we're increasing the stress intensity if I actually were to do some sort of model of the stress where do you think the maximum stresses are they're more intense at the root of that crack right and this form Griffith's formula he originally derived it in terms of stress intensity not material toughness he said the effect of stress at the root of the crack is equal to this and the longer the crack the greater the lever arm that's basically prying on the tip of that crack right so greater stress intensity it go to lever arm basically right the lever here that I'm pulling so that's that's the concept of stress intensity now it turns out people learned 25 years later that it's the material toughness that resists that stress intensity and so what you're really looking for is you want to design a structure such that the material toughness is greater than the stress intensity okay 
If the material is more tough than the stress intensity, you're not going to get a brittle fracture and the crack won't run. So we ended up using the same letter of the alphabet, K, for both the material toughness and the stress intensity, even though they're two different things. One is the stress at the tip of the crack. The other is the ability of the material to resist crack propagation. Okay, so this is a material property. This is a stress intensity determined by the geometry of the system and the loads applied to it. This can be tabulated in a list of properties of the material. This has to be calculated based on the geometry of the system and the loads applied. Okay, so they are two different things. You can put either one of them up here, but you have to stop and think, what am I using this equation to do? Am I using it to calculate the stress at the tip of the crack, or am I using it as a question mark to see if the material toughness is greater than or less than the stress intensity, which is what this is, right? Sigma square root of pi A is the stress intensity. So sometimes I'm comparing K of the material to K of the stress. In some cases, I'm just calculating K of the stress. So I, it's the same equation, but students often get the two different applications mixed up because we, were, we had enough lack of foresight to use the same parameter K, or same letter K, to express the two. Uh, but it all goes back to this, this same fundamental formula. Okay, now, we are continuing to learn about brittle fracture. The Navy learned about it with the Liberty ships in that book that I passed around. <coughs> they found in this report and several others that none of the Liberty ships that had a fracture toughness, and the fracture toughness, one way to measure it going back over 100 years, in fact, I think last year or two years ago, we had the 100th anniversary of the Sharpie test. And Sharpie, with a capital C, was a French mechanical engineer or metallurgist who basically, a little over 100 years ago, took a piece of steel and put a little notch in it, basically in a 10 millimeter, he was French, right, so we're in the metric system, in a 10 millimeter square bar of steel that's, uh, I can't remember if it's 80 millimeters long or 100, 100 millimeters, but a little bar of steel, he put a two millimeter notch. And there are very stringent specifications for how you machine the root of that notch so you get the right stress intensity. The sharper the notch, the higher the stress intensity, so you gotta be consistent. And he just basically hit it with a, a pendulum hammer and if it absorbs lots of energy, the pendulum tends to stop. If it just kind of goes through it like there's nothing there, the pendulum swings all the way up to the same height it started at. And so you calibrate this pendulum and you measure foot-pounds of energy absorbed in fracturing the piece of steel or other material. Um, so the Sharpie test, they knew about 100 years ago. And sometimes people, but they didn't have it in any of the designs in World War II. And it turns out some steel that came out of the steel mills had Sharpie toughnesses of five foot-pounds. Other steel might have 20 foot-pounds. When they did the studies on the ships that, that cracked, they found none of the major cracks occurred if the steels had more than 10 foot-pounds of energy. So lo and behold, put a little safety factor on that. In the 1950s, they started saying 15 foot-pounds or greater. Now the problem is steel tends to have lower toughness or have toughness that is a strong function of temperature, right around room temperature. So you have to not just specify the fracture toughness, but you have to specify at what temperature. For example, um, typically, we get as we get more and more failures for more and more reasons, uh, mostly because we're applying higher and higher stresses as we get sharper and sharper pencils or better and better computer programs to design the stresses in systems. We're pushing things. We're we're loading things at higher higher levels of their total capability than we used to, um, and we're losing the safety factor we used to have as we get sharper and sharper pencils, as we calculate things with computers better and better, right? We're basically shaving our sa safety factors. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're always at the leading edge. Um, 
and or some people call it the bleeding edge okay because things tend to break up and cause a lot of bleeding um, so as we lose the safety factor people have been pushing up the requirements on toughness so in the in the mid 50s the Navy said 15 foot pounds at maybe minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit um, well now it's more like 20 foot pounds at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit which is also minus 40 degrees centigrade um, and there are all kinds, there's, there's a huge literature on this because it relates to all kinds of fractures. The Northridge earthquake in California, there were absolutely no impact requirements or toughness requirements for, for buildings because what building is going to get an impact? Well, they didn't think about earthquakes, right? And earthquakes do cause impacts. And at Northridge, they ended up with, what, $10 billion worth of damage to the buildings or something like that because they actually had the beams and column connections snap because of weld defects, which were the notch, or poor toughness in the weld metal or the steel. Because when they built these things in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, absolutely no requirement for toughness of the steel in a building by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Now, after the Northridge earthquake, which was what, 1991 or 92 in California, whatever it was, it was about 10 years ago, all of a sudden the civil engineer said, ooh, toughness could be important if you had an earthquake. So now they've rewritten the codes, and so now the steel has to have a certain toughness if you're in a seismic zone. Well, just about every place in the country is a seismic zone. Uh, there's an example of rediscovering fracture toughness. Um, Every few years, there will be some major failure caused by the fact that things don't have very good fracture toughness. Now, the Navy knows almost too much about toughness, and they tend to require higher toughnesses than anyone. They, they put safety factors on top of safety factors on top of safety factors, and it's now costing them a small fortune. But um, that's better than have, having the, the catastrophes that occur otherwise. Um, and. I think you have a handout in the 337 notes of the Alexander Keelan disaster. And I don't remember, did I talk about that in the uh, tapes? Okay, if I didn't talk about it. The Alexander Keelan <coughs> was a uh, uh, offshore oil, oil, oil rig in the North Sea. It had been converted to a hospital, not a hospital, but a hotel. And it had over 200 people basically in, in berths sleeping there. So these are people who oil, um, roused about oil roustabouts out there drilling oil, but they had to sleep at some time when they weren't on shift, and so they would come over to the, this platform. Uh, the Keelan had really originally been designed as a drilling platform, but it had been converted over to a to basically a hotel um, out in the middle of the North Sea. And what happened to the Keelan was well, it tipped over in the middle of the night in a great big storm, but it had five legs, and these legs were I don't remember if they're 12 foot diameter, maybe inch or inch and a half thick steel. I mean, it's pretty good sized legs because the thing was, you've got the handout that describes this. But it tipped over in the middle of the night. And what had happened is um, originally you have these great big legs and you had cross braces between the legs. And I think this cross brace too was like four feet in diameter. It was not a small cross brace. And attached to this, was a little flange, uh, pipe and flange, sticking out of it, they were gonna stick a, a sonar uh, sensor on. And uh, the rest of the structure, it had been built in the front shipyard, and the rest of the structure had all kinds of toughness requirements and everything else to make sure that you didn't get cracks or fatigue cracks grow and things, so the material had good toughness to resist this stuff. Except this was just an attachment. And you don't have to worry about attachments, right? because it wasn't really going to be stressed in theory. And so it turns out rather than all the regular shipyard welding people and all the engineering staff, this attachment was assigned to the maintenance department to attach to the, to the uh, thing. Because this was just a bracket to hold on a, a sonar detector. Well, it turns out, first of all, they never used the sonar detector. So this was actually you know extraneous uh, and didn't even need to be there. Uh, and that's often a, a problem in things that people put extra things on that aren't needed and they create little stress concentrations but a crack started there fatigue crack and it grew grew um, 
It went down this, and then it went all the way around one of these lakes. Okay, and it turns out some divers had been down there to inspect this just two weeks before. Of course, they didn't find anything. Of course, now you have to ask, well, was you know, they just kind of figured, ah, it's good enough. We don't need to go look at it. We'll just sign off that we did. Right? Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it does raise the question when you've got, you know, a 36-foot-long crack, uh, why they couldn't find it. Um, just two weeks before. But nonetheless, this thing was a huge crack that had grown around this thing, and then a storm comes up in the North Sea, and the whole thing tips over, and like 193 people out of 227 or something lost their lives. And so there was a big inquiry by the government of Norway, and you've got a little handout that tells you about the, the Keelan. Well, that was in the early 80s. But there's another example of not paying attention to things. It turns out the maintenance department, well, they needed a six inch diameter pipe, so they just went out to the maintenance yard and they picked up a piece of steel. Turns out it was medium carbon steel, not low carbon steel. Medium carbon steel, when you weld it, has lousy fracture toughness and uh, also tends to create hydrogen cracks, which are your initial flaws that the fatigue crack grows from. So <coughs> not paying attention to detail, uh, even though people knew things about toughness. So there, we, we continue to have these things come back to bite us. The other thing about using computer programs to uh, to shave the safety factors, they, they don't describe it as shaving the safety factors, but um, this is an old building. In fact, I don't even know if we got, we don't really have joists in this building, but if you go in a lot of the newer buildings, you go to a mall and that's been built any time in the last 20 years, and they have steel joists. And these steel joists that hold the ceiling up are nothing more than might be a piece of angle iron looks like this and then a piece of steel rod and the joist will be made out of bar steel and angle iron and things like this and it sits on the columns and you put your roof on top of that right and that's what you're walking underneath and in fact it was this type of joist that actually failed at the World Trade Center it was the cliff angles right here at these points that failed and the joists came down. Not because the joists were under design. The World Trade Center was 30 years ago and we actually used to put real steel, you know, enough steel in the joists. But starting in the 1980s, as we got to computer programs that could tell you how to reduce the steel in the joists, um, if you're building a $5 million building, you may have a quarter million dollars worth of steel in the columns and the joists and everything. And if you can get another $20,000 out of that, well, you just saved yourself $20,000 worth of steel in a $5 million building. You know, that'll make you rich, right? Um, and so they shave these things down. You would not believe what people do to shave a couple of pounds out of a joist. It's a cutthroat business out there. These things are welded together. If you know anything about making an arc weld, let me tell you that you have these joists coming down a conveyor line and you have these guys welding these things, they have two seconds per weld to make the weld and inspect it. They are their own inspectors, okay? So um, it's, and, and to test the welds, as the thing's going down, they take a crowbar and they have to lift this whole joist up with the, you know, using the lever of the crowbar. And if the, jo if the weld doesn't snap under the force of the crowbar, it's considered a good joint, okay? Well, fortunately for me, because these things keep coming down in snowstorms, I've got a lot of work to do, okay, to come out and tell folks, that's a lousy weld. You know, this joist was you know, too small. Um, it happens all the time. It turns out um, they actually, to cut, cut it out of the buildings now, they look at the design. If you have an air conditioning unit right over here in this part of the building, if someone decides, oh, we're going to move the air conditioner over here four feet, the building will collapse because they put a stronger joist right underneath the air conditioner than the one that's right next to it, okay? And so if there's a design change anywhere in the process, you're now putting the air conditioner on the weak joist. These things are designed down to nothing. Now, officially, they have a 1.67 safety factor. But when you, you know, it means it'll take 67% more stress. And when they go and test these things, test a good one in the laboratory, they pass with all like 1.70 or something like that. I mean, the computer programs are very, very good. 
at calculating what a properly made joist will fail at. The problem is they're not all properly made when you start making thousands of these things and you have these guys who have two seconds to make a weld. No brakes, you know, your, your hot, unair conditioned, dusty environment uh, and you're sitting there lifting, you know, with crowbars every 60 seconds or 30 seconds a joist that weighs, you know, 500 pounds. You're supposed to lift it up and see if the weld snap. Now, how'd you like to do that job for eight hours a day? Turns out the average guy works for about six weeks. Okay, so you got lots of experience behind it, right? You know, there are a few guys who work there for 30 years. So there's only a few people like that. Other people are intelligent. Um, in any case, just another example of now that we are more sophisticated in our ability to calculate stresses, we are walking closer and closer to the edge of failure. And that's why we need higher and higher toughness. I told you that the toughness started out at 10 foot-pounds, and then the Navy put a 15 foot-pound requirement on there in the 1950s. Well, the Coast Guard for commercial ships in the 19, late 60s upped it to 20 foot-pounds. When I was working at a steel company and designing ships, or designing steels for ships for liquid natural gas carriers, I had to meet 20 foot-pounds at minus 40 in, my, in the steel I was designing. And not only that, it wasn't just in the base metal, I actually had to meet the same toughness in the weld and in the heat-affected zone. So this, they were getting really sophisticated. Rather than just you know saying the base plate has to have this toughness, they actually said, well, the welds have to have it too. Whereas early on, they didn't care about the welds, right? So they learned, well, gee, maybe it will, maybe it will fail at its weakest link. You know, that was a novel concept. Um, so they figured those things out. Well, it turns out for gas pipelines now, many times they'll be requiring 60 foot-pounds uh, at some particular operating temperature, which is more than anyone ever needed, much more than anyone ever needed to stop a brittle fracture. Why? Well, what they're really trying to do is ensure quality control in production of the steel because this fracture toughness is not only related to or fracture toughness and stress intensity is not only related to brittle fracture, it also relates to fatigue. Now, you're all young enough that, how many of you have had fracture courses? Yeah, none of you yet? Okay. Well, you'll get one, I think. There's some course over there in ocean engineering that you have to take. But in the old days, we used to have what we called SN curves, where S stands for stress, and N is number of cycles of stress. And when we were looking at fatigue, and fatigue is, you know, you take a paper clip and you bend it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and eventually it fails. Well, the number of cycles is typically put on a log scale. And we might go out in some cases to 100 million cycles. Um, but the curve for steel or aluminum, and there are whole books of this. This is really exciting reading, too. Um, there might be some band. But up here, you have the stress. If you get down to a low enough number of cycles, you basically get to the yield stress of the material. It will break, or the fracture stress of the material, either one. If you load it on one cycle to a high enough level, it will break. And so that's kind of the maximum over here. And then the strength of the material under a lot of cycles decreases with the number of cycles. Somewhere, and I didn't draw this as well as I should, let me get that a little more gentle slope. Somewhere between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the fifth, 10,000, 100,000 cycles, the curve kind of changes. And it's steeper over here. And this is called the plastic higher stresses, the material actually is yielding, just like the paper clip takes a permanent deformation. You don't usually want to do the paper clip for 100,000 cycles to break it, so you typically bend it further, and it will take a permanent set, and you're actually plastically deforming the material on each cycle in the bend. Over here, you're in the elastic region, where it's just like a diving board. You might, you might stress it, but it always comes back to the same same shape when you take the load off. 
Um, and this thing should have a little bit of a slope down. Eventually it levels out. Somewhere in here is you have the changeover from elastic to plastic, and you end up with a fatigue life out here. For most steels, the fatigue life, you don't get fatigue below about 40 to 50 percent of the yield strength of the material, there's no fatigue. It's called the fatigue limit. Now, aluminum doesn't have a fatigue limit. It just keeps on going down with a low slope. And so many times the steels that only go out to a million or, or 10 million cycles because you've re reached the fatigue limit. In uh, aluminum alloys, they'll often go out to 100 million cycles to see exactly what that slope looks like. This is the way we used to look at fatigue for the first half of the last century. Today, since the 1960s, we do a different type of curve. And this is the change in crack length, A is the crack length, versus the number of cycles, the ADN, on a log scale. And this might be down here at 10 minus 7 inches per cycle. And down here, we'll be on a log, semi log, log scale of stress intensity. And you, the, the disadvantage of this technique is if I want to get this curve, I take a sample, I load it to this value, I run it until it breaks. I run it in another cycle, run it until it breaks. And I get lots of data points. I might need to run 15 or 20 samples to generate the curve. That's expensive. With this technique, I can take one sample. It looks something like this edge loaded sample here. And I will get a curve that typically looks like this, going up here to maybe 10 minus 3 inches per cycle. 10 minus 3 inches per cycle means 1,000 cycles, the crack will grow an inch. right? Down here, it takes 10,000 cycles to grow a thousandth of an inch. So there's a big difference here, right? Um, in any case, you have what we call stage one, stage two, very cleverly named here, and stage three, crack growth. Um, in stage one, you get down to stress intensities at which the crack will not grow. Well, that's basically the same thing as over here. In stage two, you have what we call the Paris Paris law behavior after a guy named Paul Paris, one of the most arrogant people you ever meet. Okay, he actually belongs at the other university here. Actually, he's out of Ohio State, but um, uh, I always say MIT is the second most arrogant school in Cambridge. Um, and stage three is the rapid crack growth, and things start taking off and failing fairly quickly. But in here, you have a power law relationship, and that's where most fatigue cracks are growing. Down here is where they're initiating. The problem with this, or actually, you, you only take one sample and you actually measure the length of the crack during the experiment. You go in there with microscopes or ultrasonics or electrical techniques and actually measure how big the crack is at each point during your experiment. And so you get all that graph off one sample. And you could even run two samples and get redundancy, right? See if, you know, the first six one was good. This is related to a stress intensity. You must know the size of your flaw in order to calculate the stress intensity to be able to plot it. This one, you have no idea what your flaws are. Just test a bunch of them. You assume you have some flaw population, some unknown flaw population, and you just plot them and see how long it takes to break. Here, you're generating data all the way along, and you actually sometimes never even finally break the sample uh, in two. Uh, so it's more expensive per test, but there's a lot fewer tests, so it's less expensive. And it actually relates back to the fundamental equation of fracture mechanics. This you cannot do any calculations on this data unless you know a flaw size and start assuming all kinds of things. Here you actually have to know a flaw size, but once you postulate a flaw size, you can figure out exactly where you are on this curve. I've done a lot of aircraft fatigue failure or aircraft crashes where you've got the fatigue crack and you go and you look in the microscope and you say, well, gee, right here, looking at the crack and the little marks it leaves behind, it was growing at 10 to the minus 5 inches per cycle. That means the stress at this point in time was so many thousands of PSI. 
or the stress intensity, um, at, and you can, from that you can calculate the stress. And you often can be within 10 or 20 percent of the real numbers, the actual numbers, when you do this uh, type of stuff. So you can get lots of information off the final fracture by going and looking at it this way. So this is this is much more scientifically based. This is empirical. Um, they're both still used in all kinds of applications for studying fatigue. Um, the more fracture toughness you have, the more stress intensity you can tolerate and not get fatigue in general. Um, now, let me just, as we get towards the end here, I mentioned last time, oh, I got them in here, ceramic scissors. When I was maligning ceramics and saying ceramics don't have much toughness, people for in the back uh, 15 years ago said, oh, ceramics have great high temperature properties. You can go to much higher temperatures than metals, and this is all true. And therefore, we could use them for engines and improve the thermodynamic efficiency. And so we're going to develop structural ceramics. Well, the problem with structural ceramics is a moderate steel or nickel alloy has a fracture toughness, this is just moderate, of 100 KSI square root of inch. Those, that's the units of fracture toughness, right? KSI for stress and square root of the crack length. So it has these funny units. Otherwise, you can do, uh, this is equivalent to about 110 megapascals meters to the 3 halves. Or something like that. Okay, uh, so you can use whatever set of units you want. They don't make any sense because they go back to the, the equation there. Anybody have an idea what a really good ceramic might have compared to one of those metals? Which that's just an average metal. About the best ceramic has a fracture toughness of one ksi square root of inch, which means that. If I've got, in a metal, if i got a one-inch flaw, or actually if I have a third of an inch flaw, okay, pi times a third is one, roughly, um, have a third of an inch flaw, I could put 100 KSI on there before the thing would, would fail. In a ceramic, if I have a third of an inch flaw, I could put one KSI on there, which is not very much stress. If you pass these around, you can actually see notches in here. I mean, the, the scissors are extremely sharp and will stay sharp forever, except for the fact they will chip if you look at them cross-eyed. Okay? This one, I haven't done much with. And if you want to cut some paper, you can. They're nice and sharp, except if you run this one, you can feel the notches. You can't see them on this one as readily, but it's got chips taken out of it. And so the problem with structural ceramics and hundreds of millions of dollars were sent, spent because the ceramist says, oh, well, we're going to, they have great strength, great high temperature properties, and we're going to make structural ceramics. Well, this was in the 1980s, and the ceramist had not learned what the metallurgist learned in 1945 about the Liberty ships. You need some toughness in a structural material. They had not learned what the civil engineers had not learned at, uh, for the, uh, the Northridge earthquake. The civil engineers were still learning it in 1990. Um, and so people are always talking about wonderful properties of these new structural materials, but if the material does not have fracture toughness resistance, it's a piece of junk for a structural material. It may have fantastic electrical or optical or magnetic properties. And ceramics have revolutionized electronic materials. But if you're talking structural materials, which is what we're talking about in this course, ceramics are junk. The only, I used to say, the only uh, uh, large-scale manufactured products, structural products made out of ceramics are Portland cement and toilet bowls, okay? Or I used to say the kitchen sink. In the kitchen sink, you have to line it with cast iron to give it fracture resistance. So you get a porcelain sink, yeah, it's ceramic, got great corrosion resistance, great stain resistance, okay? But if you just made it out of porcelain, you drop a pot in there and the whole thing would shatter. So you have to line it with cast iron, which is one of the most brittle metals we have. So you make a cast iron sink so it won't fracture when you look at it cross-eyed. Um, so 
you have to be careful. Um, there are lots of people out there who tend to forget simple things about fracture toughness. Uh, and that's probably enough for today. Okay? Thank <laughs> you.